award-winning posters that the um, people who got the awards can come up after the plenary to, to pick up. Um, posters are very important and are a valued part of the CSTE annual conference. And personally, I know it's actually harder to make a good poster than a presentation. I mean, it's really difficult to, you know, distill down the important information you want to have for people to see in, that's both visually appealing and something that you want to look at. In 2011, CSTE began to recognize the work of poster presentations by offering up to six awards, one for each CSTE steering committee. There were about 600 abstracts that were submitted for participation in the 2013 CST Annual Conference, and over 200 were selected for poster presentations. Of the over 200 abstracts selected for poster presentations, only 29 were considered for the award according to eligibility requirements. To recognize each finalist, CSTE has published their name and abstract in your agendas, as well as beforehand they identified the posters with a blue ribbon. Felt like I was at the 4-H fair. CSTE has published the name, um, I already said that. So each, each, each steering committee award winner will receive, as I said before, a plaque that's going to commemorate their achievement. And. There's a slide, is there a slide up that says, okay, so the 2013 Outstanding Poster Award presentations go to, uh, for chronic and maternal child health, Kevin Alex Kovach, and his poster was, does the county poverty rate influence birth weight and infant mortality in Kansas, a multi-level analysis of vital statistics and census data 2006 to 2010 from the Johnson County Department of Health and Environment. So let's give a hand to Kevin. If you're here, Kevin, would you stand up? Would you stand up, Kevin? Thank you. Very nice. Come get your plaque afterwards. Okay, now the uh, award-winning presentation or poster presentation for cross-cutting goes to Allison Nelson from the Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute, and her poster was the differential re reduction in near-term births for white versus black births in Ohio, 2007-2010. Allison, are you here? Please stand. Okay, I hope someone gets her award. Representing her. Well, thank you very much, and there'll be an award up here after the plenary so you can take home. And now for environmental health, occupational health, and injury, we have Sarah Radigan. Sarah Radigan, are you here? Please stand. Her poster was called Using Data to Guide Occupational Injury Prevention Strategies for Young Adult Hispanic Workers in Massachusetts. And let's thank Sarah Radigan. Now for infectious disease poster, we have Bryn Berger. Is Bryn here? Because she's the outstanding winner. Bryn from the Tennessee Department of Health. And Bryn's poster was entitled Risk Factors for Fungal Infection Following Injection with Contaminated Methylprednisolone Acetate in Tennessee. Thank you very much. So now we're going to go on to the surveillance and informatics poster awardee and winner goes to is it G-I-A-N, is that Win 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 Hua Shen, Win Hua Shen from New York State Department of Health, using space-time scan statistic to detect pertussis and shigellosis outbreak. Are you here, Win Shen? Thank you very much. And last but not least is the student award for the presentation and poster presentation by Lauren Finn from Drexel University School of Public Health. Laurel Finn, are you here? Very good. You're the acceptee. And her, the title of her poster was Utilization of Hospital Billing Data to Analyze Trends of HIV, Hepatitis C, and Hepatitis B in Southeast Pennsylvania. So I want to, again, give a round well, uh, welcome and applause to all the poster awardees. So again, your plaques will be up here afterwards, and you can come and pick them up. And I want to thank you again for everyone who submitted a poster, you know, because you all really should be honored for going through the trouble of getting it, and these special people that, that really did an outstanding job. And now it's my honor to introduce Denise Koo that's going to be coming up and going to be giving awards to the Applied Public Health Informatic Fellows. So thank you again, Denise Koo.
So, um, folks in the audience probably know that for many years you've been on my case, rightfully so, to put informatics fellows in the field. You know, we had this informatics fellowship since the late 90s at CDC, and we were limited to placing them at CDC because they are funded because we didn't have core money for the Public Health Informatics Fellowship. They were funded by the CIOs paying for the fellows, and they weren't entirely interested in putting them in the field, even though that's a lot of where the frontline needs and learning is. Um, we did manage to get them out on some info aids, and you can continue to call us for informatics assistance um, and when, when you want to and can um, come together with us to define a need. But, when the PPHF was passed, and, uh, when the ACA was passed, and it had this attachment of prevention and public health funds with some um, bolus of money for workforce, we said, we have got to get people out into the field. And so uh, a couple of years ago, we said, we've, we've got to do this. And we took the opportunity and asked CSTE and ASTO and PHII, the Public Health Informatics Institute, to work together, which has been a beautiful partnership because, of course, informatics needs to not be over here. It's all of what we do. I've looked through this entire agenda of this meeting, and you see informatics everywhere. You see surveillance and informatics as two tracks over here for the breakout groups, but it comes up in so many of the sessions. So we got PPHF money, as usual. It came late in the year. In fact, we don't even have this year's PPHF money yet, although I think we were supposed to get cans this week. And we asked the partners to work together, and they scrambled and tried to figure out how do we work together, CSD, ASTO, PHAI. It was wonderful. They put a late call out for recruitment. I was just hoping for a little bit of success with you know recruiting um, applied public health informatics fellows to put into the states, this last minute request for you in the states to host them. And it has been an amazing year. These fellows, from everything I'm hearing from you in the states who are begging me to keep doing it and to make it two years and let us keep these folks, to the um, ASTO folks who've been doing the site visits to hear about what these fellows are doing, they have so far surpassed our expectations. It has been an amazing pilot year, and we are going to be continuing to do this. So we wanted to make sure you were aware that we're doing this with PPHF dollars for as long as it comes, um, and as long as nobody takes it to do something else um, at the agency, we're going to continue to use our PPHF dollars to put as many fellows in the field in Applied Epidemiology, the CSD, CDC, Applied Epi Fellowship, that's how we're funding it these days, um, at least with the funds that come from my office, the Applied Public Health Informatics Fellowship, and to the degree we can, the EID Laboratory Fellowship. So we would like to introduce you to some of these fantastic fellows who not only worked on projects planned by the host sites, but they rose to the challenge. And as we all know, this informatics area is not simple. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of really hard work, engaging people, keeping people at the table, agreeing on requirements, um, cajoling, <laughs> keeping people coming to the meetings, building bridges between programs and end users. Um, and these folks did these, built these bridges that didn't exist before. They made some real advances and meaningful use in several of their locations. People have been hiring them as fast as they can um, as they finish these fellowships. They have really made, um, they've built communities of practice. They've taken the lead on surveillance projects for both the Republican and Democratic national conventions. They took best practices from other states by its nature, of course, informatics is a cross-cutting, systems-based approach. So they, therefore, they don't just look in their own state, they look at what's going on. They look at the systems issues, not necessarily just disease-specific issues, which is, of course, important and needs to be addressed, but you've got to have people who take a systems approach. So. Um, it's been really, really wonderful. We have a new group of fellows coming in. In fact, we've grabbed one of them for the Public Health Informatics Fellowship, and we're going to be expecting her to help us figure out what we should do in the next few steps. So I'm really glad that we have this partnership between CSD, PHII, and ASTO. And I'm going to introduce to you each of these fellows who are still here um, one by one. So I'm going to start with Carrie Eggers, who is who was based in Florida with Janet Hamilton. Carrie? Okay. 
Okay. Um, and is Kiki Conquo here? I think he left overnight, right? Okay. I'll, um, well, oh, here's the alphabetical list. Okay, let's go with Rebecca Gliskin, New York City Department of Mental Health and Hygiene. And New York City snapped her up. Um, let's see, the next one is Esther Muneni at Utah Department of Health. Is Esther still here? Oh. And then Grace Oden Ogundhebi. <laughs> and I know that in the instances when the health department has not snapped these folks up, it's only been funding limitations um, because they all tell me how much they really want to keep them. Um, the next person who is here pers in the audience is Unmei Pan, who is in the Illinois Department of Health. And I believe the last one who is here personally is Rashida Shah in the Wisconsin Division of Public Health. The other two who are not personally here are, uh, and I'm sure I'm butchering his name, Ikechi Konkwo, who was in the Duval County Health Department in Florida, and Amy Liu, who worked with Brian in Washington State Department of Health. And again, they have just done a fantastic job, and I really want to thank you for making our pilot successful, and thanks also to the folks in the state and local health departments who supervise these folks. Um, we have been using this as evidence for why we should continue to have PPHF dollars uh, to use for these purposes. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Jeff Engel, a new executive director here at CSTE, and it's great to be back with CSTE. As a former state epidemiologist, I keep questioning why I ever became a state health officer, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> I'm really very uh, pleased uh, to be co-moderating uh, this morning plenary uh, after a conclusion of a really wonderful uh, conference this year. I'd like to thank the planning committee headed by Dr. Tim Jones and the rest of the executive board. Uh, for selecting uh, just a fine panel of uh, plenary speakers this year. It was, it's just been truly outstanding, and that's going to continue this morning. Uh, I'll also introduce my co-moderators this morning from uh, North Carolina, Dr. Megan Davies, and from um, <coughs> Oklahoma, Dr. Christy Bradley. I'd like to thank those two state epis for uh, co-moderating with uh, me this morning. It is my pleasure now to introduce our first speaker, uh, Emily Halubovich, if you can come on up to the podium. One of the first duties I had as the executive director was uh, hiring a new uh, advocate uh, lobbying group for us in Washington, D.C., uh, as uh, Marsha Maybe, who had done this work for CSTE for 20 years, announced her retirement one month after I took uh, my office. <clears throat> So um, I issued an RFP to five agencies, and uh, Emily's firm, uh, Cavarocci, Ruscio, and Dennis uh, won the bid. And I tell you what, um, I haven't looked back once. Uh, she's been fantastic. Uh, Emily uh, did a great job with our March executive board meeting, which is in the Washington, D.C. area, arranging hill visits for the, for the board, and for me, with the Office of uh, Budget and Management, with, uh, with the uh, within the president's office. Um, and it is with this lobby lobbying and advocacy activity is what your individual dues go for. And if you don't think this is important, uh, let me tell you, this is important. Uh, the work that is done in, at this level really can make a difference. And I hope that after Emily is done with her presentation, uh, you will be doubly convinced of that. Her bio is in the program, um, but she's had years of experience doing this. She is fantastic, 
And uh, what we liked about her was her expertise in health, particularly public health. Please welcome Emily Holubovich. Well, thank you so much to Jeff and Tim and the executive board and for you all for having me here today. This is such an honor to address you in the plenary. Um, one of the things we're going to talk about today, and it's difficult at 8.30 in the morning, is the federal budget. <laughs> um, and we're going to talk, uh, help you understand what's happening in Washington and really the undercurrent that's driving um, the fiscal policy and really, frankly, health policy discussions. Um, and while I try to be uplifting at the end, I want to make sure I give you some feedback on what you can do about it. Because I think while things look grim, we can turn this tide. Um, but me, as your paid lobbyist, if you can see the scarlet L burning through my jacket, um, I can't do myself. And I hope to, by the end of today, you'll realize that not all lobbyists are bad. Um, so with that, and I, out of respect to my colleagues, I'm going to set my timer um, so I can stay on track. So if you've been watching the news, um, everything is about fiscal policy. Discussions about the deficit and the debt are really driving everything. Um, or Okay, so the, apparently the NSA is listening to my talk today. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. And just so you know, I paused my timer for that alarm. So, okay, we'll resume. Um, so fiscal policy is really driving any, everything. And while the discussion is about the deficit and the debt on the surface, that's really what not, in my hypothesis, what this conversation is about. The conversation we're having in Washington, and hopefully by the end of my talk you'll um, agree with my hypothesis, is not about the numbers. What we're having is a fundamental conversation about the role of government in our lives. Um, and there is a significant movement to restrict the size of government. And why that's um, particularly concerning for you all, as I look at the um, plenary uh, list and the agenda participants, most of you happen to be employed by government at some level. And public health, by its nature, is a public good. Um, and so what that means is, whether you like it or not, you are government. And so as we're having these conversations about restricting the size of government, those are going to really impact you and the ability to do your work. So as I go through this talk, I want you to keep that in the back of their mind that this is not about the numbers. It's really about a, a much bigger philosophical discussion. So here we go. I do have some charts. Um, this is a representation of federal spending in fiscal year 2011. We spend about $4 trillion annually um, at the federal level. And it's usually not in the areas in which you think. The cool tones on this pie chart represent what's called mandatory funding, or funding that flows directly out based on current law. Um, the largest mandatory programs are, of course, the entitlements. These are those you hear the most about, Medicare, uh, Medicaid, Social Security. Um, there are other uh, entitlement programs included in mandatory spending, and also actually interest on our national debt is considered part of uh, mandatory spending. As we do not have enough funding to cover the services and programs that we want to buy each year, we borrow from state governments, federal governments, others, and we pay interest on those loans, um, and that is considered mandatory spending. All in all, in fiscal year 2011, this is really before most of the major deficit reduction strategies start, started taking effect, we spent about two-thirds on mandatory spending. The remainder in the warm tones is what we call discretionary spending in um, budgetees. And discretionary spending is not meant to imply these programs aren't important, simply that these spending levels for these programs are determined annually or maybe every 16 or 18 months, it seems, um, at the discretion of Congress. Um, discretionary spending actually only makes up about one-third of our budget, and so what is discretionary spending? Um, it includes, in, in Washington, we tend to break it down into two categories. It includes defense spending, which, as its name implies, is pretty straightforward. It's spending on the Pentagon, and our military budget is, it does not include war spending, which um, happens to occur off budget. That's a different conversation for a different day. Um, 
But there's something called non-defense discretionary spending, or NDD, which is really everything else. Um, and this is really what people think about when they think about the government. Um, this is obviously public health and includes education, transportation, homeland security, veterans affairs. Um, all of this is encompassed in non-defense discretionary spending. And as you can see from this chart, um, what we spend on health discretionary, and this is really the public health service, so all agencies of public health, including the National Institutes of Health, represents only about 1.7% of what our federal government spends annually. So it's a really tiny fraction. I would just know, juxtapose that against what we're spending on health care entitlements. You can see there's clearly an imbalance. Of this health discretionary, only about 0.7% um, is SAMHSA, FDA, CDC, HRSA, all other agencies of the public health service. NIH, National Institutes of Health, represents about 1%. Um, so as you can see, what you're doing is a tiny fraction of overall spending. Um, as a result of deficit reduction activities uh, in 2011, we passed something called the Budget Control Act. Um, and the Budget Control Act sets limits on what we can spend annually on defense and non-defense discretionary spending over the next decade. What we see over this decade is this is even before sequestration, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, is that the, the share of our pie for non-defense discretionary and frankly defense discretionary is shrinking dramatically. Over the next decade, what's available for non-defense discretionary spending goes from 18% to 11%. Defense is shrinking from 19% to 12%. And we see growth in the mandatory spending going from two-thirds of what we spend annually in 2011 to about three-quarters. Um, so what we see is the mandatory spending and driven particularly by health care costs, is crowding out what's available for everything else. Um, and what's happening within the non-defense discretionary piece of this pie that you don't see here is that there are some discretionary programs that act more like entitlements. Included in this orange slice of the pie is also veterans, um, the Veterans Affairs Department, which includes veterans health care. It also includes Pell Grants, and so uh, based on analyses from the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, what we will actually see over the next decade is this, that programs of health care benefits for veterans and Pell Grants are going to begin to crowd out even further what's available under that orange piece of the pie. And their estimate is that in the next 10 years, to continue to provide the same level of programs and services that we're providing now in non-defense discretionary spending, we're going to need $600 billion more than what's available under the spending caps that have already been enacted. So that's a problem. <laughs> and that means, um, obviously, things are going to get much, much more difficult for us going forward. I think what's, um, and to my point, that this is more than about the numbers, What's interesting about discretionary spending is that the deficit reduction activities that have been active to date really don't address the problem, which are namely health care costs and historically low levels of revenue, the money coming into the government that we're able to spend. Um, and so what we can see is that if you look at the numbers, you could eliminate this entire section of the pie, discretionary spending, including defense, eliminate all of it. We are still running a deficit of half a trillion dollars a year. Um, so in many ways, as an advocate, as I look at this, and we like to, I try to be evidence-based in my advocacy, is that we are not making policy decisions based on the evidence and really trying to address the root drivers of the problem, which again, to me, says this is not about the problem, it's, and the problem isn't the budget and the deficit and the debt, it's really about the role of government. So. Um, sequestration. I like to refer to this as look, ma, no hands budgeting. Um, sequestration, as we talk about the sequester, you know, I always say we're not talking about sequestering jurors like on Law and Order. We're really talking about sequestering money. Um, it's a further budget enforcement mechanism to, again, rein in um, discretionary spending and stay under those already stringent Budget Control Act caps. What it does is it cuts a trillion dollars in addition to the $1.5 trillion that have already been cut under the Budget Control Act um, between fiscal year 2013 now um, and the next uh, 10 years. 
In fiscal year 2013, this is an $85 billion cut um, to discretionary programs alone. Um, so across the board, roughly, you're looking at about 5.1% cut to public health and other non-defense discretionary programs. You're also looking at almost a 6% cut to mandatory programs uh, that aren't exempt and are not Medicare. Um, things like the Prevention and Public Health Fund, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, but what's been lost in the media is that sequestration is not just happening this year. This happens for the next nine years. And so in fiscal year 2014, as we look forward to next year's budget, we actually have to cut another $109 billion from discretionary spending next year and every year thereafter. There are certain programs that are exempt from sequestration, namely um, entitlements that benefit low-income and vulnerable populations, uh, Social Security, Pell Grants, and Medicaid. Medicare is subject to sequestration, benefits are not, um, but administrative costs are, namely um, provider payments, um, which is creating an interesting dynamic in Washington. So this is a graph that shows just how bad things are and how bad they're going to get. That top line, the dotted line, is a historical average of discretionary, non-defense discretionary share of federal spending um, at, uh, in our share of GDP, or our overall economy, which has historically been about 4% of GDP. The green line shows where we were headed before the Budget Control Act, so budgets were already constricting even before we put these strict budget enforcement mechanisms in place. The blue line represents what the Budget Control Act spending caps do themselves. The red line is the Budget Control Act plus sequestration. And so what you see is that by 2021, um, our share of GDP um, for non-defense discretionary spending is shrinking to about 2.5% from just over 4% um, where we were just a couple years ago. This means that our share of the budget is shrinking to its lowest level we have on record um, historically, um, back to levels when uh, General Eisenhower was president. Um, and I don't know about you, I think our nation looks a lot different than we did um, when he was president. We have a lot of different challenges and needs, but the fact of the matter is that um, the share of the pie is shrinking dramatically. So what does this mean for public health? Um, I like to prefer, uh, refer to prequestration. This is the world before sequestration, really when budget cutting started in fiscal year um, 2010. On average, federal funding for health discretionary has been about 5% across the board, but what we see is wide variation within the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, part of the reason um, the average isn't higher is that we have an outlier, and the outlier is NIH. NIH's budget, as you know, is more than half of health discretionary spending. Their budget has also remained effectively flat. Um, what that means, though, is you've got to make up for those cuts somewhere, and where the cuts are coming from are from the other public health service branch agencies. CDC and their base budget has cut by, been cut by 18% since fiscal year 2010, so almost one-fifth. Um, and that's, remember, before sequestration and before the Budget Control Act caps. It's brought CDC's base budget to their lowest level in 10 years. Um, and CDC is not alone in this. HRSA, SAMHSA have, as well have been cut by 9, 12% uh, respectively. Um, now throw sequestration on top of that. In fiscal year 2013, uh, ASTO estimates that across the public health service agencies, excluding um, the NIH, we're looking at about a $2.5 billion cut in federal funding. That's in uh, fiscal 2013 alone. Um, it's a $290 million cut to CDC, um, but not all cuts are created equal. And so many of you may be receiving notices from CDC about your grants and contracts or you're expecting too soon. Um, there is some discretion on the part of the agencies to determine what will be cut and by how much. Not a lot, but there is a little bit of flexibility. And so you may find you get a pass and your grant isn't cut at all. You may find that, wait a minute, why is my grant cut by 10%? I thought the cuts were supposed to be 5%. Um, there is some discretion in here how the cuts are applied in fiscal 2013. Um, and wait to hear from the administration for more information on that. I think what we don't know yet is the impact of future sequestration or the Budget Control Act caps. Again, remember these programs and their funding levels are determined annually at the discretion of Congress. 
Um, so that means we have to wait for Congress to de decide how these cuts are going to be applied. But we know based on that line graph from the um, Bipartisan Policy Center that it, it is going to get worse and it's going to get much worse, I'm afraid. We're feeling a squeeze in a different way, and, and I'd like to take a minute to talk about the Prevention and Public Health Fund. Um, it is a mandatory source of funding. It was created by the Affordable Care Act to support new and innovative, transformative strategies to improve public health, um, particularly in the areas of uh, chronic disease. Um, intent means nothing, really, once a law is passed, and so what we've seen is that in this time of fiscal austerity that the prevention fund has been used to supplant and not supplement existing budgets for public health. And more and more, as we heard about the, um, the Applied Informatics Fellows, um, it's being used to support core public health activities, including the Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity Grants. Many of you um, may now be aware that half of the ELC grant funding is actually made up of the Prevention and Public Health Fund. Um, it's also helping to develop the public health workforce um, through the Epi Fellows um, and other initiatives at CDC. In some ways, I look at the Public Health Fund as a blessing. It's been able to provide a public health safety net for us, and in some ways has really masked austerity's true impact on public health. My colleagues in law enforcement don't have a law enforcement fund um, to backfill cuts that they've seen, and while we've seen cuts of about 5% on average over the last few fiscal years, their grants have been, cut up by cut, uh, have been cut by up to 50% in some cases. Um, but it is a curse, and I think it's a curse for several reasons. Um, first, it's, I know for many of you, politically unpalatable. The fact that it is a part of the Affordable Care Act means that in many states, probably some of you red states, it is um, persona non grata, if you will, and you're actually prohibited from accepting any Affordable Care Act money, even if it's not related to what most people think of the Affordable Care Act and coverage. Um, but the, the more and more we underwrite core public health activities with the Prevention Fund, puts you in a position whereby you may not be able to even compete for those grants uh, going forward. And th that is very frightening as a public health advocate. It's also politically vulnerable. Um, in case you haven't noticed, just because the Supreme Court ruled on the Affordable Care Act um, as constitutional doesn't mean uh, opposition has died down any. If any, it's ramped up even more. There have been 37 votes in the House to repeal the Affordable Care Act, including the Prevention Fund, um, and probably they're voting again today. Any chance they get, they seem to want to vote on how much they hate the Affordable Care Act. Um, but what that means is right now, obviously, with a divided Congress and a, a Democratic president in the White House whose signature policy achievement is the Affordable Care Act, we're pretty safe. Um, the environment will not always be as friendly. And so, the, again, the more and more we supplant core public health activities with the Prevention Fund means that if that were to go away overnight, what are we looking at? You're looking at a more than 20% cut to CDC's budget. Um, so part of what we're doing as advocates is educating members of Congress about what the Prevention Fund is being used for and how critical it is um, to maintaining our public health. And it's also, I love this word, sequestrable, um, which is actually a word we use in Washington. Um, it means it's subject to sequestration. So it too um, faces cuts. Uh, and so you can see in public health, even our safety net of the prevention fund um, is being eaten away by the current fiscal environment. And I realize this graph is very hard to read. Um, I call this the incredible shrinking fund because nothing is guaranteed. So even mandatory money in Washington, um, they who giveth shall taketh away. And so what we've seen is what was intended are the green bars. That was what the funding was supposed to look like as authorized by the Affordable Care Act. The blue lines are what we actually see now is available. Um, there have been a couple of things that happened. First, um, we've been using the Prevention Fund to underwrite a lot of other things that don't really have anything to do with pu public health or prevention. It's sort of become a piggy bank for other activities. Um, and this is not uh, who you might think um, would be the opponents to the Prevention Fund. They prefer to get rid of it altogether. Um, the threat is from within. 
Um, and so what we've seen with the administration is putting forward as part of proposals that didn't really go anywhere but didn't help, as part of a broader deficit reduction package looking way before even the enactment of the Budget Control Act, the President proposed taking $4 billion from the Prevention Fund and putting it toward deficit reduction. And we were like, <laughs> um, well, and then what happened? So we had this little thing um, a couple of years ago, remember around Christmas Eve, there was something called the extenders package that they were voting on the House. This was tax, extension of tax breaks, extension of unemployment benefits, and it also included a patch to Medicare physician payments. Medicare um, docs were facing a 30% reduction in their payments because we don't like to deal with things in Washington. If I like to say if kicking the can were an Olympic sport, we'd definitely have the gold medal, but we've been kicking the can so long fixing Medicare physician payments that every year we have to redo this and patch it somehow to maintain payments at current levels. Um, what that means, of course, you have to pay for it. So how do we pay for it? We took $6.25 billion out of the prevention fund to pay for 10 months worth of uh, Medicare physician payments which again, I think says something about our overall healthcare system, but nonetheless. So that's where the blue line is, was that 6.25 billion over 10 years coming out. And now in 2013, in that dotted line bar, you see the red, we've had about $50 million cut from the prevention fund due to sequestration. And that fine dotted blue line, um, which I understand is hard to see, is um, a raid on the fund to support implementation of the Affordable Care Act and the exchanges. Probably wouldn't surprise you that the President has not um, convinced Congress to appropriate any new money to implement the Affordable Care Act, but it, it's, as we like to say, too big to fail. And so how are we going to pay for it? We're going to find money wherever we can. You may have seen Secretary Sebelius has gone out hat in hand um, to many of our partners in uh, private industry to try to raise money for the um, implementation of the exchanges. Well, they took about $340 million out of the prevention fund. We fully expect them to do that again in 2014. So um, we've had a safety net. Our safety net is eroding, and my fear is that in the next um, 18 months when Senator Harkin, who's been the oops, timer done, who's been the father of the prevention fund um, and our, our staunch defender, um, is not seeking office again. Um, and so we're very concerned about what's going to happen to the prevention fund when he's gone. I don't need to tell you that these cuts have consequences. I know you all are feeling it back home. Um, we know that federal funding is actually, over time, become the largest share of state health department budgets. Um, as you, you were sort of the canary in the coal mine for the recession, you started feeling this much um, sooner than at a national level. Um, it represented 45 percent, almost half of your budgets in fiscal year 2009, with state general funds falling closely behind at 23 percent. Um, we've seen the public health infrastructure really eroding as a result. And this, these are data from ASTO. Many of you, some of you maybe answer this survey, but they do a survey every couple of months about, you know, what's the impact of budget cuts, what's happening um, back in the states. We've seen, um, and these data are um, a little bit old. I'd like to see what their next survey says, but almost 90 percent have reported budget cuts. 91% have reported job losses. Um, in total, based on data from ASTO and NACHO, we know that about 50,000 public health professionals have lost their jobs. Of course, that doesn't even include those of you who are being furloughed um, at the state and local level. And almost half have cut services. And again, this is before sequestration. Um, all have imposed some kind of cost-cutting strategy that either you're not traveling or you're not investing in new equipment or you're not filling, filling new positions once people retire, you don't have the opportunity to hire new people. Um, what we don't know yet is the impact on health. So I would love for um, one of you to start now in studying, um, do budget cuts make a difference? I think that's a valid question. Um, do, can we do more with less? Um, I think in public health we've risen to the challenge how much less um, is less and how much more can we do with less I think remains to be seen and whether or not these budget cuts are actually having any real impact on health. I think we think they will, but I, the evidence is not quite yet there. So for an advocate, this is, I look at myself as that guy on the horse. I'm kind of looking at this situation and I, I sometimes say when you think it can't get worse, it, it can't get worse and it always seems to. Last time I said that publicly, um, Senator Harkin announced that day he was not going to run for re-election, and so I've, I'm not going to say that anymore. But um, if you were here for Dr. Katz on Monday, I think I've been doing this now for almost 10 years, um, and you feel like, oh my God, it, it, this is probably the worst it's been. It's going to get worse. 
um, I really suck at this. <laughs> um, what is going on? Um, you know, but I think what's interesting is, and I'm going to get into this, the game has really changed. Um, public health has done pretty well considering um, that we don't really have a vocal constituency. We're not really engaged. Um, people have just supported us because it's sort of the right thing to do. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case anymore, and let me explain. So the new normal really will be, as you picture that line graph and the shrinking not only of our piece of the pie but the overall size of the pie, um, there is going to be fierce competition for limited resources. I call this the Lord of the Flies effect. Oh, there's the, oh geez, there's the NSA again. Okay, we'll keep going. Um, and policymakers, including the administration, are really asking, it's all about priorities. What are our priorities? And it's, it's coming down to the, the must-dos versus the nice-to-dos. So what's core and what can we kind of do without? I think the good news for CSTE is that much of what you do is viewed as core. Things that, um, you know, on the infectious disease side, on the chronic disease side, I think we've got a little more convincing to do. Um, but these are the kind of questions that policymakers are gra grappling with. It also means the cannibalization of health. So what we see is not, as policies are making decisions about priorities, the way the appropriations bills are structured and the way the process is structured, it's not about, I'm going to take some money from the Defense Department and I'm going to put it into health. It's about, I'm going to take more... Um, it's about the, um, it's about we're going to take from CDC and put it to NIH. And so, and this is true even you look at the President's budget for fiscal year 2013. I do not think it's a coincidence that the National Institutes of Health saw a $450 million increase in his President's budget request. CDC saw about a $450 million decrease. Coincidence? Um, but that's what's scary. And when you look at their constituency and how mobilized the medical research constituency is, public health, we're in trouble. Um, doing right, or what is the right thing to do, it's not enough anymore. Um, as they make decisions about priorities, they want to know what works, what are you doing, and what are you doing right now? Not what's the impact going to be on Medicare spending in 30 years when I'm probably not in elective office and I'm probably in the ground. They don't care. They want to know what's happening right now and is it working. Um, and we need to make that case. And it means that advocacy is more important than ever, and I'm going to explain what advocacy is, but we have to start squeaking louder. We have to start squeaking more often. If we don't, I promise you the NIH community is going to eat our lunch. Um, and I'm being really serious about this. And so as we think about this, I couldn't resist because I'm from New England and Tim Tebow, like what is going on? Um, <laughs> but as we say New England in Bill we trust, so we're going we're gonna to go with it. But I am your lobbyist. I am your voice on Capitol Hill. I have my ears to the ground. I'm figuring out what's going on and I'm, I'm your canary in the coal mine, if you will. But I cannot do this alone. I am your coach. I am your Bill Belichick, or whatever team you prefer. Um, less scary looking, but um, I, call, I help you. I help design the plays. I help you become a better player. Um, but without players on the field, I can't win three Super Bowls. And um, I still can't win Super Bowls. I don't know what's happening. Those giants. Um, but you have to have skin in the game. You know, for the last um, decade, it's been all about, well, we have people in Washington worrying about this, and they can take care of it for us. We can't do it alone anymore, guys. Um, talk about the flood and um, being a sandbagger. There are lots of different strategies. I need many, many more sandbags to prevent what's going to be coming. And so what can you do? I think I want to really emphasize, I know I'm over, but you can and you should do this. You have a constitutional right under the First Amendment to petition your government. And the Supreme Court has actually ruled that by virtue of your employer, you do not forego, forego that constitutional right. Now, now said, you have to be smart. And I understand many of you say, well, Emily, I'm not allowed. They tell me I can't. Um, someone in your department can. And when they say you can't, it's not about the law. I want to underscore that. It's about 
control. They want to control the message, they want to control the agenda, and they want to have control on who's saying what to elected officials. So that's an internal policy. And so really there are no excuses, and it's not just about talking to, advocacy isn't just about talking to policymakers. Um, it's about spreading the word, spreading the gospel of public health to everyone and anyone who will listen. That means there's something for everyone in this. Um, if you are on Facebook, you can friend your member of Congress. You can sign up for their listserv. You can go to their town halls when they're back in town. Engage in the political process. Many of us do, just do this once every few years, and it's called voting. Um, so let's take it a step beyond voting. Let's get some skin in the game. Let's get off the bench. Um, and let's try to engage. And it doesn't mean marching up to Capitol Hill and lobbying, but it means if you're at a cocktail party and someone's ranting about how much the government sucks, you can say, well, actually, do you know what I do is I make sure your food is safe. Do you like safe food? Yeah. Well, that's government. <laughs> uh, it's about engaging in those conversations. Again, this is a fundamental discussion about the role of government. And the reason we're having this discussion and the reason we're losing it's because people don't know what the government does. Um, they know it spies on them and reads their email, but it doesn't know about all the good things. It doesn't know about all the good things. And, and so that's where you can be a citizen advocate and really spread the gospel of public health is not by necessarily talking to your policymakers, but it's talking to the people in your department who can talk to the policymakers and say, this is really a problem. You guys need to get down there and start doing something about this. It's getting them to say to the governor, we're dying over here. You gotta help us. Um, it's about educating your neighbors and family. That's what this is about. Um, and so the opportunity for advocacy is everywhere. Policymakers do listen. And how do I know they listen? Because they're listening to the people who are calling their offices right now. And you know what the people who are calling their offices right now are saying? Government is bad. Cut spending. <laughs> and they don't know what they're cutting their nose to spite their face. They don't know what they're doing by saying that. But that is all they're hearing. And I can tell you from Democratic offices to Republican offices, that's what they're telling me they're hearing. We're not hearing from anyone about why these cuts are bad. We don't, hear, we don't hear from anyone about what we're doing is wrong. We've got to get in the game. And finally, I would just say that there is power in um, the sample of one. I know you're scientists, you think in aggregate, you think in populations, um, but stories and anecdotes do matter. And you can't underscore how much one story or one compelling incident or one um, anecdote can make a difference on the policy process. Um, and I will quote to close um, a colleague of mine who always says that data make you credible. You need the data, but it's the stories that make you memorable, and it's the stories that make an impact. Um, and so with that, my contact information, I apologize to my fellow panelists I went over. Um, I, if you're on Twitter, please get on Twitter. If you're not, um, I'd love for you to follow me. And if you'd like to learn more about the budget, I'm co-chairing a campaign called NDD United. We're trying to stop sequestration. We're trying to educate the public about what the government does every day. Um, we have a great new video that you can share and tweet and Facebook and show your friends um, and our website, nddunited.org. So thank you again for having me. And hopefully there's time for questions. Well, I'm Christy Bradley from the wonderful state of Oklahoma, also known as Tornado Alley these days. So the flood acronym doesn't quite work for me. I think about um, being flattened by a great big F5 twister and how you get back up and res have resiliency and, and fight against the forces of nature or the government as that may be. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Deborah Cohen, is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and obtained her MPH in epidemiology from the UCLA School of Public Health. And I was partic particularly intrigued to learn that her Bachelor of Arts degree is in filmmaking, so that's a little bit of a diversion from public health and medicine. Her principal areas of interest include how structural environmental factors, both social and physical, influence health. She has directed numerous projects on STDs, HIV screening and prevention, and alcohol policy. Dr. Cohen is currently a senior natural scientist at the RAND Corporation and the author of the forthcoming book entitled A Big Fat Crisis, 
the hidden forces behind the obesity epidemic and how we can end it. Please help me welcome Dr. Cohen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me back here. Um, a couple, of, I think it's a, two or three years ago, I came and talked to you about obesity. And uh, today I'm here to tell you that actually physical inactivity is more important uh, for us to address because it's a really important major health risk factor and the World Health Organization ranks it as, as more important than obesity. It's the underlying cause of 10.8% of all-cause mortality, of 12.4% of all breast cancer, 6.7% of heart disease, and 8.3% of diabetes. So it's possible to be fit and fat. Physical activity can mitigate much of the harm that's associated with overweight and obesity. When we think of physical activity, we, you know, we divide it into different categories. It's a continuum, but we think of it as vigorous activity, which is like a run or more, moderate, which is a walk, there's light physical activity, and of course being sedentary. And we think that vigorous uh, activity is actually the most important because it you know, builds muscle, makes us strong, increases fitness. Although the guidelines recommend that we get exercise somewhere between moderate and vigorous, they call it moderate to vigorous physical activity. So it's like a brisk walk at least four miles an hour. But light physical activity is better than nothing, and really where America is, most of us are sedentary, so if we could move people to light, we'd be making a lot of progress. So right now, well, how do we do physical activity surveillance? We mainly rely on self-report. You know, we call someone on the phone, we ask, you know, how active they've been, how many days, how much time. And what people respond is basically it looks like about half of the population meets our national guidelines, you know, adults and uh, adolescents. But in 2006 in NHANES, they put accelerometers on people. And what they found was astonishing that less than 5% of adults and 9% of adolescents actually meet the national guidelines. So uh, here I graphed the uh, uh, trajectory of the moderate to vigorous physical activity, uh, and you can see how badly we're doing. It's not terrible. I mean, it's, I mean, for youth, it's probably terrible, but it's, you know, we're doing better when we're young, but it really drops off very quickly, and very few adults, you know, meet any, are anything close to the national guidelines. So, what about our surveillance? Well, the value of self-report is doubtful. And these methods are, I don't think they're useful at the local level. So we need some other surveillance methods, especially to monitor community level physical activity. That's where you come in. <laughs> we need your help to do something better with physical activity surveillance. And you've, you've heard these quotes probably before. If you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. What's get, what gets measured gets done, what gets measured and fed back gets done well, and what gets rewarded gets repeated. And then without a standard, there is no logical basis for making a decision or taking action. So, first of all, physical activity occurs in a place. Everyday environments can be barriers or they can facilitate physical activity. In school, sometimes it's mandatory. At work, sometimes it's possible, but a lot of us, you know, have sedentary jobs. Uh, the lo our local design of our cities and our transit can determine whether we're walking on the streets or we're stuck in a car. And if we have parks and green spaces or events, it can stimulate uh, activity uh, and draw people outside. So how could we improve physical activity surveillance? And I think the important thing we have to do is think about direct measurement. And we should start looking around our communities and figure out what sh where should we start looking. And we, really, we have to even think about schools, work sites, our parks, and our public streets. Because that's where we can be active and, you know, in public view, we can measure it. All right, so when we think about direct measurement, it's place-based, so we can get more information about the barriers that are related to place. Would it be expensive? I'm not sure it's going to be that expensive when you think about relatively what we spend on other types of surveillance, and especially, you know, self-report where we're getting information that may not be useful. And, you know, seeing is believing. 
Well, what are the tools for direct measurement? We have human observers. We can use remote cameras. There's a lot already in place, you know. You can <laughs> see people over time, what's happening in a space, more people walking, less people walking. Uh, there's trail counters. You can actually mount them uh, like on trees or on light poles and it'll automatically count people going by. And, you know, pedometers, uh, you know, you have to have interaction with people for that and it's only useful if you have a limited time period. Um, and accelerometers, I think, are, could be a little complicated right now, but maybe we could do more with them, you know, on a large surveillance scale in the future. All right, so measuring physical acti activity in your community is going to provide benchmarks and a basis for action. We should be gathering baseline data, and we can look at different sites and, lo and look at one site compared to another and say, well, you know, why are people more active here versus there? And, and we can get clues on how we could then, you know, make more people active where they're less active. And also looking at change over time. We see, okay, how many people are active this year, and is it increasing or decreasing the following year? And then again, we can learn, like, what is the difference and why is it changing? All right, so what about schools? You know, we actually don't have any surveillance of physical activity in school, and, you know, children really need physical activity for normal growth and development. Um, schools, you know, have requirements for physical activity. They've been declining recently, but we don't really know about the quality of physical activity. And where it's been studied, for the most part, it's been pretty disappointing. Even when uh, children have PE scheduled, the goal is only to get 50% of the class time in moderate to vigorous physical activity. And most schools, when they actually measure it, they don't even meet that guideline. You know, they'll, you can see like this, kids are just sitting, waiting for instruction, waiting for their turn. And that's really what happens most of the time. So they're hardly active at school. And so there are tools, there are observation tools, there's something called SOFIT, I think systematic observation of fitness instruction time, there's so play, you can look at recess, I'm going to explain this a little bit later, and you can use pedometers. If you give a kid a pedometer at the beginning of, of PE, you take it off at the end, by looking at the steps per minute, that can correlate to moderate to vigorous physical activity. So maybe there's some kind of partnerships where we can start working with schools and give them feedback if they're doing a good job in PE. What about work sites? Well, being at work on average has reduced the expenditure of energy about 110 calories a day. And we know from many years of epidemiology that, you know, sitting, you know, is associated with greater risk of heart disease and now even metabolic syndrome. Remember the bus drivers have higher heart attacks than the ticket takers, right? And the mail carriers are lower risk than the mail sorters back at the post office. Well, what is the magnitude of impact for all of us? I mean, is it on the order of secondhand smoke, which is something we really regulate, or is it even higher? We should be measuring this. And, and what's happening now under healthcare reform? Well, they're going to be allowing employers to provide incentives for employees to engage in more health behaviors. You know, uh, they can, in, in 2014, they can reimburse people up to 30% of their health care costs if they engage in, you know, physical activity or in, adopt a healthy diet. But there's absolutely no evaluation planned of this. And so we do need uh, valid surveillance to see, you know, what's going on and if it makes sense to spend money like that. Okay, what about leisure time physical activity? Well, parks are among the most common settings. We have a national infrastructure for parks. Most people live within two to five miles of a public park, and it is a scalable setting for leisure time physical activity. And of course, these open spaces, they're designed to accommodate moderate to vigorous physical activity. And it's pretty, pretty clear that when you're outdoors, you're much more likely to be active than you are when you're indoors. In, in, and also, there's an appetite. People say, we need more green space, we need more parks, and there's this idea that if we build it, they will come. Well, actually for the past 10 years, I have been studying parks. And I worked with um, Dr. Tom McKenzie and we developed a, uh, this systematic observation which we call SOPARC, the System for Observing Play and Recreation in Communities. And we've been counting people in parks and studying how are people active outdoors. And we systematically count them and we've done a validation study we recently completed 
where we went to parks, this is 10 parks across the country in, in five different cities, and we counted people every hour of the day for 14 hours for two weeks. And we wanted to see, well, what's the minimum time that we need to actually uh, get an accurate impression of what's, of what's happening in the park and how active are people? And we count uh, the people by their apparent gender, age group, race, ethnicity, and activity level, whether they're sedentary, moderate, or vigorous. Anyway, the data collection is straightforward. I've been criticized saying, well, this is, you know, 18th century technology. Maybe it's Stone Age technology, but it's, you know, if you can count, you can figure out what's going on. And we have, we've been able to hire field staff, you know, from temp agencies. We use Promotoras in Los Angeles. And um, we're not using this clicker anymore. This year, we're starting to use iPad minis. <laughs> so we map a park, and we, um, you know, if there's a gym, we start in the gym, we, have a, we count the areas, and we systematically go around the park, and in each target area, we make sure we can see the whole area, and we count people. And we scan left to right. It's, it's very systematic. And, uh, you know, based on our validation study, uh, you can count, you know, as little as two times a day for um, uh, five days a week or four times a day for two days a week, if just, you know, to get an accurate view of the number. But if you want to really get an accurate view of the MVPA, you probably have to do three to four times a day, three to four days a week to uh, be a little bit more rigorous in what's going on. So this is just a graph where we said, well, how much MVPA does a park contribute? And this shows, this is in one park, it's the number of males in the park. And you can see weekday versus weekend. The first graph shows that in the morning there's not too many people, but it picks up in the afternoon. But on a weekend day, the mornings are busy, and then it, you know, scales down as you get toward the evening. And these are males. And we actually see way more males using parks than females. We see more children and teens. They're disproportionately represented in parks. We hardly see seniors in parks. You know, they might be 12, 15 percent of the population, but they're like one or two percent of the people that we count in parks. But neighborhood parks are really uniquely suited for this, you know, moderate to vigorous activity. And when we compare the amount of vigorous activity that we've counted in parks to what we see on NHANES, about 50% of all vigorous activity occurs in a neighborhood park, at least, you know, for the population in the half-mile radius around it. But that's because so few people engage in vigorous activity. For boys, they are engaging in less than four minutes a day, two minutes for men, less than two minutes a day for girls, and less than one minute a day for women. Um, but parks contributed less for moderate activity because you can get that in other places. I mean, it's, it's hard to run and, you know, play basketball and do other things except in a park. And also it varies across parks. You know, some parks have different facilities or smaller, so you can have very little activity in a park to, you know, as much as 41 percent as, as what we've measured based on these 10 parks. So we've also done some studies to really see, well, how much do people use parks? And we put GPS monitors and accelerometers. We did this with a group of adolescent girls in San Diego and Minneapolis. And, and, and next, I'm going to tell you about adults that we've done that with, too. And we found that uh, between 13 and 16 percent went to a park at least once a week, that 6 to 9 percent went um, more than two, at least two or more times a week. But th what was surprising to us is that even though they lived about a third of a mile from a park, they more likely went to parks that were six to eight miles away from their house. And when they were in a park, they engaged in six to seven minutes of MVPA. But when they went, they got more physical uh, MVPA than on days that they didn't go to a park. And uh, then we did this with adults, and we had 238 adults wear the GPS monitors and accelerometers for three weeks. Uh, we recruited them mainly from parks, so you can see there's a little bias, they're more likely to be park users. And, but we had a similar situation where uh, even though they lived uh, 0.4 miles from their house, they actually went to parks that were on average two and a half miles from their home. They went to parks about three times a week, going to two and a half, you know, an average of two and a half different parks over these three weeks period. They stayed 50 minutes but they only spent 6.2 minutes in MVPA. 
But the good news is they got a lot of MBPA just going to and from the park, you know, on the way there and the way back. So it, it contributes not by just having, you know, activity there, but on the transport to and from. Well, we've interviewed people, uh, residents within a half mile of the park in, in five different locations, and we've studied six parks in each of these different cities. And um, it varies, you know, in, in Ohio, we had people saying um, fewer than 20% said they went to their local park uh, once a week or more, and it was up to almost 40% in Los Angeles. But it varies, and then how long do they stay at parks? It, it says, they're saying about, you know, a little more than an hour to almost two hours every time they go. But we have a lot of people that never go to their local park. And it was highest in Ohio, but on average about 40% of people never go to their local parks. And what we see is that parks are often play deserts because there's nobody there. You know, whenever we rotate around, about 60% of the time, the area is totally vacant. So our parks are really underutilized resources. You know, we have this big crying problem, and there we've got a solution, but we're just not taking advantage of it. So you know, there's other problems. We don't have any nationally representative data about parks, and there's a huge difference on how every uh, jurisdiction manages its parks. We don't have historical data on trends in park use, staffing, or programming. And we don't really have science that guides park policies or investments or staffing, you know, or how we optimize outcomes for local populations. So what I want to do is tell you about Finland. Now, Finland is very different than the United States. They actually have a deliberate effort to have their parks increase physical activity for their local population. They shifted from the, in a, a competitive elite sports paradigm to physical activity for all in the 1980s. And their municipalities, actually, they mandate an election of a sports board, and their mission is to promote physical activity. And in the 90s, you know, 24, 20 years before we have the Let's Move campaign here in America, they had a Finland on the Move campaign. And then in 19, since 1995, they have a program called Fit for Life where they're actually trying to promote physical activity in people 40 years of age or older. We haven't targeted adults or seniors at all in this country. And, and that's where the you know, big problem is. But they promote physical, uh, lifestyle physical activity and non-competitive sports. And over 90% of Finns say they use their public parks and recreation facilities. And it looks like Finland is the only country in the developed world where physical activity is increasing in the population, leisure, leisure time physical activity. But it's also self-report, so we have to take it a little bit with a grain of salt. But it, just, it does seem like they're doing a lot better job than uh, most other places. Okay, so we have many barriers to physical activity in our communities. And of course, budget cuts, like you've heard, that's affected parks a lot. They have cut programs, they've cut staff, they've limited their hours. Um, they also have policies that restrict physical activity in public parks. They have more pay to play. They have permits, they, have, they lock up their green spaces, especially if they're putting on this new artificial turf. And, you know, a lot of people want to keep, you know, people out of parks. Um, we've really uh, studied in detail parks in Los Angeles. We have a project where we looked at 50 parks in all different kinds of neighborhoods, and we compared parks in low-income neighborhoods to higher-income neighborhoods. And even when you control for size, Parks in the lowest income neighborhoods are used 35% less than parks in higher income neighborhoods. Um, well, people are more likely to walk to lower income area parks, but that's because you don't have people who want to go to those neighborhoods uh, when they can go to a wealthier neighborhood uh, and go to the park there. And so people travel from at, on an average of two miles to go to parks in higher income neighborhoods and less than one mile in a lower income neighborhood. But the, the main reason why the parks are used less, it's because they have fewer programming. There's just less going on. There are less events, there are less things that draw people to those parks. And so we see that facilities without programs do not attract users. 
And, we, and we've seen that in all of our studies that programming really correlates with the number of people we count. And Jane Jacobs called these demand goods. So um, we've also had a chance to evaluate some park interventions, and it's ma mainly case study type data. We've used um, direct observation. We've also tried to measure cost effectiveness, where we see, well, how much money did we spend to produce how many METs? And we translate METs. Is, METs is the energy expended at rest. And so if you're uh, sedentary, we gave, it's a little bit better than sleeping, so we count one and a half METs. Walking is three METs, and vigorous, we give six METs. Although, you know, there's a continuum. That's was our convention for counting METs. So here, uh, you know, people talk about, you know, the inner city, there's no parks, and they said they've turned vacant lots into parks. So here's one in Broadway uh, in Los Angeles, and this was Marson Park. It's in the valley here in Los Angeles. And uh, we looked at three pocket parks, and we compared them to local neighborhood parks, the playground areas, you know, because they're very small, and they're about the size of the playground area in a bigger park. And we found that they were used uh, as well or better than the playground areas of larger parks in similar neighborhoods, and that the users walk there. And the cost effectiveness was about 73 cents per met. And usually between 50 cents and a dollar uh, is, is really cost effective. I've looked at fitness zones. Have you seen these? You have the outdoor exercise equipment in parks. And um, we looked at them in 12 parks and compared them to other parks where they didn't get fitness zones. We found they were used throughout the day, and how well they were used depend on where they were placed. And we saw some modest increases in observed uh, moderate to vigorous physical activity. And if you just look at it, you know, just, well, how many extra METs were produced, you know, we could say that it was about 11 cents per MET. Um, but I don't know about statistical significance. Um, you know, we had six, 12 parks, and in six of them, we had an increase, and six we didn't, you know, for the number of users. But overall, uh, the, the METs increased, and that's because when you're in those fitness zones, you're vigorous, you know, if you're moving those bars and, you know, doing the exercise, you know, so you get extra credits uh, for that. What about skate parks? Those are kind of exciting. I can't say anything about injuries, but... Um, when we looked at seven of those, and we didn't count just the skate park, but we looked at, well, how did it affect the whole park, that in five of the parks we studied, uh, the whole use of the park increased. Um, in the two that we didn't see an increase, one of the, both of those uh, skate parks were situated in areas that weren't visible from the street. One of them had been vandalized, and another one was just a little bit hard to access, so maybe that was related to why they weren't used more. Um, we also recently completed um, a randomized control trial to try increase park-related physical activity. And the 50 parks we'd been studying, we randomized them to three different conditions. We tried to get the community involved. So one condition was a, like a CBPR where we had the park advisory board and the park director deciding what would they do to try and get more people to be active in the park. And we gave them $4,000 and some training. Another arm, we just had the park director decide what to do with the 4000 And then we had a control group where they didn't get any money or training. And we used SOAP Park to measure the park use before and after uh, they did the intervention. And the training that we did is we emphasized how important it was to have excellent customer service and doing outreach and having staff be visible and using special events to promote routine activities and programs. And uh, they really spent their money on three different things. One was signage, you know, just letting people know something was happening. The other was promotional incentives, giving out little, you know, water bottles or doodads, you know, to have people feel like they had a good experience. And then they, you know, also had more group activities or, you know, just this third group, we lumped everything else. And, um, you know, some of these parks, like, you see a park, but there's, like, no signage, there's no banners. I mean, a lot of people don't even know the parks are there, so we put up bulletin boards and some. Like, even, like, where's the front entrance for this park? We put a placemat just to let people know. Uh, and some put in uh, walking paths, and they put up signage uh, around the points of the walking paths. Anyway, what we found was, you know, compared to the control group, if we did nothing the park lost users and they had reduced physical activity in the park on the order of 146 fewer users per day, 325 fewer METs expended, roughly 6 to 10% decline in the average park use. But doing something actually increased users. So we saw 
in the in the both intervention arms, 174 more users per week per park, with 571 more METs expended, and that's roughly equivalent to getting 429 more people walking briskly for about 20 minutes. And so the use increased by about 7 to 12 percent. And the cost effectiveness is pretty high, about 14 cents if we said, well, the effect only lasted about 20 weeks. Uh, and you can see uh, we had, when we, um, when we did this, you know, we had the uh, uh, um, significant results in the uh, arms, especially when they were combined, it was stronger. But the effects were mainly in males, and we could say that the signage was responsible for 50% of the impact. So we had a dose response. The more signs, the more activity we saw in the parks. So in summary, there's a lot of competition for people's leisure time, and parks really need to compete uh, in the marketplace for that. You know, we have so many ads, you know, go to this movie, watch this TV program. There's so much advertising for sedentary activities, and there's like almost none to get people out and be active. So we need to do something about that. And the secular trends suggest that there may be declines in park use, but they have a large, parks have a large untapped potential to increase, uh, to increase population physical activity. And we can attract users, but we're going to have to pay attention to it and have some modest investments. Well, what about using social media for PA surveillance? You know, I think we could potentially recruit uh, cohorts to measure PA. You know, we have apps like Foursquare, uh, that people can report their location or GPS in smartphones and accelerometers in smartphones, but the challenge is going to be getting representative samples so we can see what's happening over time. Okay, in conclusion, measurement is necessary to spotlight physical activity. If we can throw light on something, maybe we can change it. And context-based measurement is critical to understand the conditions that foster physical activity. And epidemiologists are essential to controlling chronic disease, but we have to measure how people interact with the conditions in which they live. Thank you. I just want to let you know that the, there's an app for using SOPARC. Uh, it's available online. Uh, I know there's a group in Portugal that actually made a downloadable iPhone app called iSOPARC. And I just want to remind you of a book coming out in January, uh, Big Fat Crisis. Okay, thank you. Good morning, I'm Megan Davies with the North Carolina Division of Public Health, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Mickey Tripathi. Dr. Tripathi holds a PhD in political science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a master's of public policy from Harvard University, and an AB in political science from Vassar College. So it must be quite a shock to him to find himself on the West Coast. Dr. Tripathi um, is the president and chief executive officer of the Massachusetts eHealth Collaborative, a nonprofit collaboration of 34 leading Massachusetts organizations. And this morning, he's going to speak to us about health information exchange and public health. So thank you, Dr. Tripathi. Morning. Um, I've got to say I'm humbled by Deborah's and Emily's talks before me. I um, was also struck by, um, we had Deborah talking about working in parks and poor Emily talking about working in the zoo. Um, so, uh, sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, and uh, um, so, I'm, I'm Indian origin, specifically Hindu origin, so I'm steeped in reincarnation. And the only thing I conclude is, is, is that Emily did something very, very bad in a previous life, and, and Deborah clearly did something very, very good. Um, so, you know, as I was thinking about uh, this talk, um, and it's not only alienation from the West Coast, um, but also don't uh, spend a lot of time with, uh, um, with, uh, in public health specifically. Um, you know, I thought a little bit about, all right, so what's going to excite a group of epidemiologists? Um, you know, I could say, hey, mojitos up in my room after the, you know, after the uh, meeting, or I'll, you know, download my, uh, my, my daughter's um, 
uh, Spotify uh, playlist and we'll you know, all dance out in the lobby or anything. But what I concluded was that data is what would really get all of you excited as epidemiologists. So I thought I would start off talking a little bit about data. Um, I don't, um, being uh, born and bred in Massachusetts, um, I need to kneel before Emily for putting Bill Belichick in her presentation. I've got to, you know, always have to think about how to work him in uh, um, to every presentation. But let me just dive in and talk about health information exchange. Um, before I do this, though, let me just ask for a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with meaningful use and the high-tech program? Beautiful. Okay. Almost all of you. And accountable care? You understand the basic concepts of accountable care? Okay, fewer. Um, but all right, so I can throw that jargon around and, and most of you will know what I'm talking about then. I want to start with this picture though. Um, so what is this picture, you may ask? Uh, I was the founding CEO of the Indiana Health Information Exchange in Indianapolis, which is um, one of the most, if not the most successful uh, collaborative health information exchanges in the country. Um, it was uh, founded in 2002, 2003, but it was building on a tremendous amount of work um, by some of the legendary figures in health information exchange um, uh, in Indianapolis at the Reagan Street Institute, Dr. Clem McDonald, Dr. Mark Overhage, and a, a number of other uh, physicians out there. And they um, had over 30 years been building repositories of data, aggregating data across the hospital systems in Indianapolis. And this picture, um, when I went out there, I was the, as I said, I was the founding CEO of the Indiana Health Information Exchange, which is really an organization that was taking the work that the Reagan Street Institute was doing, aggregating data from on the inpatient side and thinking about how we move that up into the community and think about the ambulatory side because I think as all of you know that's where most health care happens um, uh, out on the ambulatory side so we increasingly need to get um, health information exchange um, out and out into the community so one of the things that I asked and Indiana, Indiana is very Indianapolis is very unique in that all the hospitals are connected via a health information exchange and in particular there are 11 emergency departments in the city they are all connected so that if any one of you showed up in an emergency department in any emergency department in Indianapolis, they would, with your permission, have access to any other data that any of the other hospitals has um, in, in, uh, uh, you know, about your care, which is very unique. There is no city in the country that has that right now. Um, this picture, which I asked them to generate, is a picture of the home zip code of every person who got care in any emergency department in Indianapolis in the year 2003. And you know, a couple of things that, you know, that, that, uh, uh, that I wanted to point out here that really speak to the challenges that, uh, that we have as we think about health information exchange. Um, so you know, first off, I mean, I looked at that picture and thought, wow, I mean, you know, so I have a very strong East Coast bias that everyone wants to be in the East Coast, right? And I look at you know, this and think, well, wow, gee, you know, Indianapolis, I mean, there's a lot of people going and, you know, coming to and fro from Indianapolis. Who would have thought? Um, and, you know, imagine what San Francisco or Los Angeles or Chicago looks like if we drew that map, right? Let alone Boston, New York, Miami. Um, so that's the first thing is that, you know, we, we do, we are a very mobile society. There is some type of need for health information exchange, although I think the second thing that you can see here is that it drops off dramatically. In health information exchange, we refer to the inverse square law, which is, you know, for those of you who are familiar with electromagnetic um, uh, dynamics as well, um, you know, the inverse square law is that it dissipates with the square of the distance, right? And as you can see here, I don't know that it follows exactly the inverse square law, but the need for health information exchange starts to dissipate non-linearly as you start to move away from the city of Indianapolis in terms of um, uh, the information that any particular provider would need to provide care for an individual who showed up in, in their office. Um, the third thing that you can't really see here because of the granularity of the picture is that that density has sort of a natural resting point as you work your way down. And what I mean by that is that, that information density. And what I mean by that is that we're a very fragmented country. Right? We're um, in, in sort of a, a strong government versus weak government spectrum. Um, we're, you know, the United States is kind of a weak government. It's actually a very weak government in the industrialized world. And that's not a pejorative term. That means that by design, it is a weak government from a federal perspective as well as from a state, um, a state perspective. It is very unusual in the United States to have top-down activities driven by the government, except for eavesdropping, but that's, you know, that's a whole different thing. So, you know, top-down programs, I mean, it's very hard to have those imposed. And we saw a lot, you know, from, uh, from Emily um, as well as Deborah about the challenges of trying to do anything um, from the top-down, even though we would all agree that they're rational, efficient, all of that, we don't, don't live in that kind of society, right? And again, it's by design. It's by design. So, 
as we think about health information exchange, one of the questions that you always come to is, what's the natural resting point for the aggregation of data in a way that is going to be research ready, is going to be um, uh, normalized, and is going to be something that sustains itself in terms of that aggregation happening year in, year out, so that you can use it for a variety of purposes. And you might like to think, and we used to think that it was going to happen at the national level, clearly it's not. And as you work your way down, the question is, where is that, that level where there are enough people, enough organizations who can get together with the resources and with the business trust and with the organizational confidence and enough value that they can recognize that they're willing to fund that type of activity, right? And, and the reason I raise that is that you know, that's going to be a theme that we come to as we talk about health information exchange because that natural resting point seems to be going lower and lower and lower in the market, which is, which is sort of a challenge, actually, as you think about you know, public health and population health because there aren't these sort of state-level aggregation points that we used to think about with respect to health information exchange. And the hope of epidemiologists and others such as yourselves, I think, was that those would, would be created by other means, and then you'd just be able to tap into that data for a whole bunch of great things, right? Well, the reality is it's probably it's looking like it's you know, not, not happening in quite that way. And so the question for all of you as public health people is how do you tap into where the market is headed? Um, because, you know, I think one of the um, other things that uh, I think that, you know, was, was shown dramatically by Emily in her presentation is that in those pie charts, you think about you're 1.7 percent. You're not even 1.7 percent, right? You're in that little 1.7 percent sliver. Whereas Medicare, Medicaid are something like 20 to 25 percent, if I did my quick math right from the pie chart she showed. And those programs through meaningful use and high tech are really driving where the industry is headed right now. And so to the extent that with your little, you know, less than 1%, you're going to have very little authority and very few resources to drive the market. Whereas if you can piggyback and try to align with what's happening through the Medicare and Medicaid funding streams, that's going to be the, you know, the surest bet to be able to get, um, you know, what you need out of the system in a way that's going to be sustainable over the long run. Um, so that's my whole talk. Thank you very much. Um, now I just have a whole bunch of slides that, you know, kind of explain that, but I wanted to get to the punch right away. So let's just think a little bit about health information exchange. And, and so I'm going, to I'm going to talk broadly about health information exchange as a concept, where the industry is headed. Think a little bit about the, about the building blocks of health information exchange. I'm going to remain cognizant of time. And then I'll, I'll speak specifically about Massachusetts um, as a, just an example of, uh, you know, some of the things that I'm talking about. But, it, you know, Massachusetts is just an example of, you know, I think a, a trend that's going on across the country. So in terms of the industry itself, we're really in a period of um, transition from what I would call HIE 1.0 to HIE 2.0. And the idea of HIE 1.0 was, um, and it's not to be critical because I was, you know, a, a part of it, is that it was focused on the idea of the noun versus the verb. What do we mean by that? Um, the idea was that we, you know, used to think of an HIE as being an HIE. It was an organization um, that was bringing together um, data in a way largely thought of as solving a market problem. The idea was that the market isn't solving this problem, so some organization, some kind of nonprofit collaboration needs to step into the middle, solve this market problem that individual organizations are keeping all the data to themselves, um, get in the middle of that, try to create some kind of value uh, proposition across those organizations in a nonprofit collaborative way, be a repository of information that could be used, um, collected once and used for um, a variety of purposes, right? And that's, that's really, you know, the Reagan Street Institute out in Indianapolis is one of the, you know, the premier examples of that. Um, again, that's been built over 30, 35 years, so they've been at it for a long time. But that's, you know, sort of one of the premier examples. And the thought was that that would be the model for the rest of the country. And you could almost imagine, you know, that there was sort of this idea that it would be very hierarchical, but rational and, you know, sort of roll up at a local level to a state level. You would have state level. HIEs, which would have these repositories of information that could roll up into some type of net national network kind of concept, right? Where is that now? Shattered. Um, it is not going to happen. Um, and, you know, why is that? Well, there's a variety of reasons. One is, you know, we are now moving very rapidly forward um, to a world where the good news is that, that uh, organizations and providers get it. They understand that they need to become interoperable. And one of the things that, you know, that I come back to as a um, uh, coming out of the business world and being relatively new to healthcare is that the reason that we weren't interoperable up until now is because people didn't want to be interoperable. If they wanted to be interoperable, we would be, but they didn't. 
And very few providers um, uh, talked to their vendors and said, the thing you need to do for me is make sure that I'm connected with the cardiologist and with the hospital and with that competitive hospital across town. Right? Never happened. Um, what they wanted was customized workflow to the craft that they practiced within their practice. And this cardiologist is different than that cardiologist is different than that cardiologist. And they hammered their EHR vendors, GE, Clinical Works, Epic, to create customized solutions to their individual craft. Right? That's why we have what we have today. The good news is that we're moving to a different world for a variety of reasons. We'll talk about that in a second. But it's more focused on the verb, health information exchange. So you don't think about health information exchange as an organization. It's more about a verb. And that can happen in a variety of ways. And what we're seeing in particular is that there is, there is no sort of real organized hierarchy of this, which is sort of a blessing and a curse. Um, there is no national network concept anymore. To the extent that you hear the Office of the National Coordinator talk about health information exchange or a nationwide health information exchange, it is about standards and protocols. Um, that's not a national repository of information. Again, aside from the NSA, that's not a national repository of information. Um, and that's not a national network, even, um, driven by the federal government. Um, the state level health information exchange organizations are highly varied and very locally driven. And most of them face a fiscal cliff equal to what the federal government is facing. Worse, because they can't print money. Um, so that's, you know, that's coming up now as the high tech dollars start to f work their way through the system and um, are going to start to ebb here over the, next, um, over the next year. So we're going to start to see a lot of the state level HIEs, I think, go down. Um, the last is that there is a lot of growth. So where is the growth? It's in these so-called private HIEs, which are vendor and ACO driven. And I'll talk about that in a second. But that's when I was speaking to the sort of the resting place for where HIE, you know, sort of equilibrium rests. It's sort of moved down into the market where there was this idea that maybe the state level regional collaborations would be where it rested and that we could tap into that. It's starting to move its way down to the private HIEs, which are much more community focused, much more business focused um, uh, as, as accountable care starts to really drive the need for um, uh, interoperability and for aggregation of data um, in a uh, sustainable way. So I've talked a little bit about what's driving um, this transition. Um, you know, sort of uh, one big thing is the limited success of the prior, prior model. Um, so, you know, we've all got to face that in the HIE industry that um, the failures of that previous model are what move us to the, um, to the current model. But there are a variety of other things happening from the bottom up that are, you know, that are driving um, the, the transition from this sort of big view of health information exchange as a repository of information or multiple repositories of information to this smaller kind of view of health information exchange being about a web of connectivity and exchanging information in a variety of ways. Um, and I won't go down um, through all of those. Uh, uh, you can read those. Um, but one of the things that I do like to point out just sort of as a background before we dive into um, uh, you know, the next set of slides, um, is that if you think about health information exchange being in a set of building blocks, one of the things that's very important to recognize is that, and this doesn't have a, uh, oh, I think it does have a, uh, no, that's all right. Um, one of the things to recognize is that there are sort of thresholds that we can think of in terms of complexity of health information exchange. And you can start at the bottom, where what I would call, you know, just sort of basic messaging capability. So it's one step up from faxing, essentially, um, secure faxing. For those of you who are d familiar with the direct protocol with a capital D, that's now a standard for transport for meaningful use stage two. That's, you know, th it's that kind of functionality that we're talking about here. Um, and certainly a lot of the public health transactions can live in that world, right, with, you know, with ELR reporting, or immunization registry reporting, point to point, secure messaging one way. Sender knows who they're sending to, they securely um, encrypt it, send it to the recipient, public health or another provider, you know, what have you. Um, that's relatively easy to accomplish. I know um, I was talking at breakfast with a number of people from a number of states who were talking about, well, yeah, that's easy, but gee, we've been hammering away at ELR for seven years now. And, you know, and, and so even the easy stuff is difficult, right? But I would argue from a health information exchange um, perspective, that's the really, really easy stuff. So to the extent that that's a challenge, you can you know, sort of see the challenges we have going forward. So the next threshold up, as we think about electronic health information exchange, is what? It's the query of information. So the first level is pushing. 
And that's relatively easy from a technical perspective. It's also importantly easy from a um, policy perspective because I don't need patient consent or specific patient consent or other legal, um, I don't start to bump into other legal requirements. Why? Because that's essentially mimicking the world that we live in today. Faxing, for example, except it's more secure. Right? So for the most part, you can live within existing um, legal paradigms um, and, and existing workflows within provider practices and what have you. As you move to the next level, though, you start to get into a world of hurt, um, both with a from a technology perspective, because there are no national standards for one system querying another in a secure way, but also from a legal perspective, because you start to get into questions of consent. And that varies widely across the country. There are some states um, for which, like Tennessee, for example, which HIPAA is the binding constraint. So that's fair enough. That's a relatively easy problem to solve. Essentially, you can do whatever you want. Um, I shouldn't say that. But there are very, very limited strictures on, on you know, what, what you can do. But you get into any other state, um, uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Indiana, California, Texas, um, they have consent requirements that are above HIPAA. And now you start to deal with those. And of course, in a very, you know, what's very frustrating about you know, our, our country, which is you know, the laboratories of democracy, is that every state's privacy rules are different. Many of those, if not most of those laws, also written for a paper-based world. So they don't always apply. And I'm not even talking about special um, uh, sensitive conditions like um, CFR 42, um, the substance abuse provisions, or mental health, or HIV, or genetics, which of course has federal perspective, but also every state has a different set of rules around that. So that's where you start to get into really complicated stuff. And then as you move higher and say, well, that was just about my being able to query a system and get information back. Right? I'm not even talking about the data being normalized in any way. But if you start to go to that next level and say, oh, I want actually some semantic interoperability, meaning I just don't want the information. I want those lab codes to match up so I can start to do some good stuff with it. Um, well, that's where you start to really say, well, I need some more fundamental business alignment around the way that happens. Right? And where is the aggregation point for that? You know, where can you get enough of a collective responsibility or a shared responsibility of all those people who are contributing that data um, to care enough about it to have it be normalized in that way? And that's a real challenge in our decentralized um, uh, uh, healthcare delivery system. I am going to bet that within five miles of where we are, there are probably, what, five, six, seven hospitals, all of whom have very different lab nomenclatures in their labs, right? And there is absolutely no regulation over it, and there's no authority except for CLIA, which is a very, you know, high-level uh, kind of reporting responsibility. So that's one of the challenges that we face. And as we move forward, the need for that aggregation starts to find that resting place in the integrated delivery networks. Um, but it's harder to make that argument that it's going to go at a regional or a state level. Again, because who has the authority? Who has the funding to create that kind of you know, business sensibility and get everyone aligned around a set of things that's beyond just, all right, fine, I'll securely email you something. But you know, if you ask me to normalize my data to the way you want it, sorry, I can't do it. It takes too long, too hard. I've got 50 other projects on my, um, uh, you know, on my list. So as we think about health information exchange, then it comes in many shapes and sizes. Um, and that's you know, sort of fundamental to HIE 2.0. And one of the things, and I think I'm hammering this point over and over again, um, is that the higher up you go, the more sort of external coordination that's needed. And I think that's where we face the challenge as we think about health information exchange and why it's kind of moving down in a way, is that we found that as we tried to go up, higher up, that that external coordination wasn't there. We could not get these repositories to get formed. We could not get the normalization, um, you know, sort of the imperatives that are required for that in the business processes and the funding to be able to do that at any level higher than what the businesses themselves are going to support now really fueled by meaningful use first and foremost, but accountable care as the meaningful use dollars start to dry up. And that's why you're starting to see that resting place being what, what I was talking about, that private HIEs there in the middle. That seems to be where a lot of this, and the vendor-specific um, um, HIE. So what are these things that we're talking about? Um, the other thing that I should point out, though, before we, dive, before we um, um, touch on that for a second, is that there are different types of integration, too. And I think, you know, being in public health, and you're all data people, so you, you know this. Um, but one of the challenges with respect to health information exchange as well is that, well, you and me um, and, and I want health information exchange to mean about exchanging data. 
and actually being able to incorporate data, being able to have it normalized so that I can have it comparable across provider organizations so that I can do great stuff with it with respect to population health, public health, and what have you. The reality is that that's not necessarily the business driver for those who want health information exchange because that's a very high bar to hit. So what we're seeing in the market is that the data integration, which is there on the left side, which is sort of nirvana, doesn't really happen that much in the market right now. Right? You start to you see it a little bit in specific transaction streams like e-prescribing and labs. You see it, you know, within EHR networks. So we'll talk about in a, sepic, uh, a second, like Epic and eClinic orgs, who have proprietary networks that connect just their users. Um, but other than that, you really don't see it that much. Um, it's very, very difficult and a very big challenge, really owing to the fragmentation of healthcare delivery and the fact that it's essentially still a craft enterprise in the United States. What you're starting to see more of, though, is document integration, which is just the ability to send and receive stuff, right? You're starting to see that, you know, grow all over the place. Um, and you're starting to see visual integration, which many of you may think, well, that's not health information exchange. All I'm doing is having a login, essentially, to someone else's EHR through my own EHR, right? The, why is that taking off? Well, the reason that's taking off is because it's really easy to implement. It's really easy to implement, and it solves the, um, the squeaky wheel, the squeakiest wheel right now, who is that provider sitting there in that hospital who wants access to that ambulatory data. And if you can just give me a port into that ambulatory practices EHR, that's all I need. Right? That's all I need to care for this patient. Yeah, it doesn't solve any of the population health stuff. It's not going to get quality data. It's not going to do any of that. But it solved that squeakiest wheel. And if any of you are hospital CIOs or you know hospital CIOs um, right now, they are the most miserable people in the world right now because it's a very challenging place to be. They're, they're woefully underpaid for the incredible amount of challenges they have and the risks, the real risks that they have from a personal perspective as well as with respect to the patient data that they are the stewards for. So it's a real challenge um, you know, to do that. So that's, again, in a way, it's a good thing because you, know, you would expect that you want more health information exchange and the, and, and the more options you have for doing it, the more you're going to get. Um, the bad news from an epidemiologist or anyone who's, um, who cares about performance measurement, which is my, what my organization cares about, is that everyone isn't driving quickly toward the data integration um, piece of this. And it may mean that if you know, some of these other ways, which are a little bit cruder, um, uh, you know, take the urgency away from it, it may mean that it takes a little bit longer for us to get the, to the data integration. Um, so you know, that's, that's one of the challenges that we face. So what's going on in the market? Um, you know, I've already touched on a little bit of this. The national level HIOs are the most comprehensive HIE implementations, but they're really thin. So that's, you know, you're not going to have a national solution in that way. Um, if you look at the state level collaborative HIE activity, and, I, and most of this is really what is funded by the National Coordinator's Office, and I'm sure many, if not most of you, are somehow connected to some kind of state level activity going on in your state. And I'm sorry to deliver the news that most of you, I'm not going to name any individuals, but most of you are probably involved in state level activities that may, you know, may not survive um, once the high tech dollars flow. And all of you know that, because I think, I'm sure if if you're involved in them, they are very, very focused on sustainability, and it's really hard to figure out how that works. Um, but looking at the data for a second, one of the things that's also very clear is that not that much has happened in terms of transactions. In absolute numbers, you could look at that and think, oh, well, gee, that's, you know, that's, not, that's not so bad, you know, given that uh, we've only been that, at this for a number of years. Well, you start to parse the data and you realize, well, Indiana is the biggest one at 14 million. Well, that was before all this new stuff, right? As I said, that's 30, 35 years of investment they've been making, you know, for a very long time, um, funded by the federal government in ways that are not really replicable. So once you peel that away, you start to see, oh, gee, um, you know, maybe it's not you know, nearly as much as we were hoping for. Um, and these are, um, uh, you know, these states, obviously it's not 56, which is states and territories that got funded. The ones who aren't listed in these charts had zero, literally zero. So again, I don't mean to be you know, a harbinger of bad news. It's more about trying to give you some guidance on where should you be investing from a public health perspective and thinking about where the puck is headed, um, you know, to use the tortured hockey analogy, rather than you know, where it is today or where some of the propaganda coming out of the federal government, I'll just say that um, politely, <laughs> um, is you know, what might otherwise lead you. Um, because you, know, you don't have the resources to create infrastructure, obviously. Um, so you know, trying to figure out where is this headed and how can you tap into that, I think is you know, what I'd, I'd like to leave you with. 
In terms of the EHR vendors, that's where, as I was saying, a lot of the growth is. And you, know, you can look at Epic, eClinical Works, Cerner, just look at Epic. 2.2 um, million records per month are exchanged within the Epic network. That is Health Information Exchange because it's different organizations. So it's Cleveland Clinic um, you know, exchanging with another Epic customer. They're different legal entities. They just happen to be on the same platform. Because they are, they're able to exchange the information. Um, that's 2.2 million. It's well over 4 million a month. I think now. If you look back on this slide, that means that Epic, as a single vendor in the market, accounts for more than all the states combined, right? All the state level um, HIEs combined, as you, as you start to think about you know, those, uh, uh, the number of transactions. And that's leaving out eClinical Works and Cerner, who are the other two big, really big players in the market um, who are doing this. So we're starting to see a lot of growth there, um, you know, for better or worse. But those are sort of aggregation points as we think about it um, and as the market is really changing over time. The other thing I'd just like to point to for a second, and I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to um, uh, quickly go through these next set of slides, is that the things that we think are resolved are also not resolved. So that's a challenge for, you know, for all of you and for all of us. So we were talking about this in the, um, uh, at breakfast as well, is that the lab market, for example, from a federal perspective, um, we've thought that, well, gee, if you can just get Quest and LabCorp to move, now they're not covered by high tech, so that's one of the challenges in this weak government world that we have, that the statute doesn't give the federal government any authority over Quest and LabCorp. So they live outside of the $30 billion that's being, you know, uh, that's being put through high tech and meaningful use, which is a challenge for all of us. But the thought has been that if you can get Quest and LabCorp to move, that'll solve our lab problem. Well, as you can see here, Quest and LabCorp are, what, 20 to 25 percent of the overall lab market. And again, all of you are in public health and epidemi epidemiologists in particular, so I think you know this. Most of this is in hospital labs, and they are, you know, the Wild West in terms of, you know, the way they manage lab data. The other question, as you might think about it, and these were slides that I prepared for the National Coordinator's Office, who had a big public hearing on October 29th and asked me to do a presentation on the current state of HIE, and, and they found some of this fairly sobering. Um, the one question, you know, also is, what percent of lab results are delivered electronically today? And I think being data people, you'll, you'll quickly recognize that there is a problem with, um, uh, there's difficulty in answering that question in that we don't, know, we don't know the denominator, right? How the heck would we get that? Um, because we don't have a national lab system like we have a national prescribing network, um, uh, namely uh, SureScripts. Right? Um, we don't have a national lab network, so how do we even get that data? Well, I took a different angle on it and thought, well, what, what if I go to a big vendor, the leading, one of the, you know, the leading hospital vendor in the country, EHR vendor, namely Cerner, and they have to deal with paper and electronic transmission, being a vendor. So I asked them, of all your customers, what percent of labs are delivered electronically? And they said, 10% via HL7 interfaces, 10% which is you know, kind of a shocking number when you think of it. And Cerner, for those of you who are familiar with the market, Cerner is actually at the high end of the market in terms of you know, hospital um, sophistication. So they sell to the higher end hospitals in general. Um, and again, I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but hospitals who have more resources and are more likely to have things be electronic, right? You start to think about what's going on you know, down at the lower levels. And you realize that, you know, again, this isn't a criticism, it's just that the market takes a long time to move. Um, so in terms of codification of data, that's the other thing that we want to know. I went to Athena Health, another large vendor in the space, to ask the question, well, what percent of labs are LOINC encoded? Um, because again, that's something that we all want. Um, and we live in the Wild West here. Again, it's hard to get that data otherwise. So I went to a vendor whose job, who makes it their job to get all of the paper results as well as the electronic results from their customers. So that's why Athena is a little bit different than other vendors. So they would have a very good cross-section of the market. Um, albeit, you know, subject to the bias of, you know, who their customers are. But they pointed out that only a fourth of the labs that they get, either pay in paper or electronic, are LOINC encoded. So, again, another challenge for all of us, you know, how do we figure, how do we figure that out? So, um, I'm going to quickly move through these two or three slides just to talk about Massachusetts to give you a perspective on what's going on, you know, and this is really just an example, um, you know, sort of a crucible, one crucible among, you know, 56 across the country of, you know, how are these changes in health information exchange affecting, you know, um, uh, look, how does that look on the ground? So, in Massachusetts, we're seeding, starting to see each of these bubbles represents a private HIE um, initiative that's, you know, bubbling up from the bottom up. 
no state direction, no state um, dollars involved, no federal dollars involved, well, federal dollars except through high tech, um, but really driven by, by organizations that are seeing that the market requires that I be interoperable, interoperable at some level, and what they're saying is that's at a sub-state level, that's at a sub-regional level, that's in my business market here, which is I'm Bay State Medical Center down there in the, you know, the middle of the um, sort of the leftist side there. I just signed a, um, an ECO contract with Medicare. Um, I have me plus five other um, ambulatory practices, all on different EHRs. We're all different legal entities, but I've got shared risk now with them, so I need to create a repository of information to uh, manage that risk for that contract that I just signed. Right? And that's what we're starting to see across Massachusetts and New Hampshire and a variety of other states. The statewide HIE role is to essentially connect those up. Right? It is not to be a repository or a solution for their ACO needs because one of the things that I would argue is that there is no state level HIE in the country that is going to solve the ACO business needs of any organization. They're not fast enough, they're not nimble enough, they're not well resourced enough, and they're not focused enough to be able to solve Bay State's problems and Emerson Hospitals and Mass Generals and Brigham Women's. It's just impossible to think of a state level organization doing that. So what we're doing in Massachusetts is having the state level HIE solve a very simple problem, which is how do you connect up those silos with a very simple infrastructure that just allows people to send stuff back and forth or query, but that preserves aggregation, and this is where the public health um, question um, comes in again, to the edge rather than being at the center. So the health information exchange isn't about creating a repository of information. It becomes an efficient conduit for an organization to send that information by their own design. And public health is a significant and premier um, participant in the statewide HIE. And we're increasingly in Massachusetts moving toward having that be the sole way that the state is saying that they want to receive um, the public health transactions that are required um, either through meaningful use or through the public health uh, requirements themselves. Um, there are a variety of ways that that can happen. You heard from Richard Platt earlier about the MDPH net, um, I think, and, and that's essentially a technology that says, let's bring the questions to the source, run that locally, and then pull out what we need, rather than saying, let's aggregate all the clinical data and then run it on our side. Um, the, uh, uh, the last thing I would you know, point out is the, you know, we're, we, my organization is in the middle of this mix and some lessons that we've learned. We have a quality data warehouse where we get data from a variety of organizations. We normalize that data, we run analytics and then provide it back to them. There's a chain of events here that has to happen in order to get good clean clinical data in our fragmented healthcare delivery system. And it starts with documentation all the way on the left hand side to presentation all the way on the right hand side. And a lot of the activity that we've seen in the market is focused on the data warehouse, that blue drum there, as well as the presentation side. But I will tell you, and this is probably true for all of you too, as you're trying to get public health data, I spend 90% of my time all the way on the left hand side is how do I get any kind of rationality to the data that I'm getting in so that I can do anything with it um, in order to uh, uh, you know, be able to produce the performance measures that uh, our customers need um, uh, you know, in order to improve themselves and, um, and, and try to improve healthcare overall. So what are the implications for public health? One, heterogeneity, unfortunately, is going to be the hallmark of HIE activity in the coming years. There's just no way around that. Um, that's the way the market is. You think about how fast and um, how fast your cell phone you know, becomes obsolete. Um, my Galaxy S2 was really, really cool a year and a half ago. Now it's completely up to obsolete. It's cracked, and I'm not even doing anything about it, right? Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, uh, and that's, that's true in healthcare as well as it's true in your, in your life. What we're seeing is multi-layered HIE modes seem to be developing as business, um, as, as sort of the business drivers of this emerge. What do I mean by that? If you think about other types of interoperability that happens in other sectors outside of healthcare, there's sort of two big categories. One is what I would call B2B. And that might be how you think about a public health transaction. B2B meaning it's relatively arm's length. I need to send you stuff once in a while. I can do that through a simple HL7 interface, send you the, you know, the ELR or the reportable conditions report or the immunizations once in a while, and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. That is one level that's going to happen as you think about that happening with discharge summaries being sent to providers, um, with you know, referrals being sent to specialists, more and more, and meaningful use is driving that with stage two um, uh, you know, for, in order for that to happen. But there's also the deeper integration that you see, for example, with Walmart and its supply chain, or with Toyota and its supply chain, where it's a deeper supply chain type of integration where they do business every single day, and they have shared risk, and they want to really get into each other's businesses 
in a fundamental significant way. And that's that ACO style HIEs that we're seeing. Um, and so in a way, the state level HIEs are going to play more and more of this B2B function, I think, or at least the ones that survive are going to play, are going to realize that they have to play more and more of that B2B um, function and relegate themselves to that and let the market develop um, with these uh, uh, supply chain style patterns, which is about that deeper integration. So the challenge, I think, from a public health perspective is to figure out how do you follow the contours of that um, and be able to sort of, you know, skim off the top of that without requiring that people start to go through extra hoops for public health because that's a challenge. And, and as you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a struggle to get that. So aggregation at the edge where the HIE is more the conduit rather than the aggregator. And I think, you know, that's the big change from that 1.0 um, world to the 2.0 world. And then finally, finally, to the extent that you can, aligning with what's going on in the market. Um, with you know, meaningful use and ACO um, development is going to solve a bunch of those needs over time, I think. Um, but it is over time. And that's one of the challenges for us. But directionally, that's you know, where that stuff's headed. With a little bit of push from public health, um, I think that that can you know, get accelerated. But I think we're all going to have to be patient as we start to see um, you know, those systems get put in place um, and, and mature over time. So I apologize that I've gone a little bit over. Thank you very much um, and really appreciate it. <laughs>